Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this SICC webinar in partnership with your fellow chamber member, Brunswick. I want to thank Brunswick for this collaboration. For those of you who may not know the firm, Brunswick is one of the most respected names in helping businesses manage critical issues so they can not just succeed, but excel. That respect has everything to do with the quality of the Brunswick team, which is very much on display this morning. Our guest speaker is retired four-star Admiral Mike Rogers, who was the former director of the US National Security Agency and commander of the US Cyber Command. Mike is a senior advisor with Brunswick Group. Our moderator this morning is Sunita Chalam. Sunita is a former Singapore diplomat, a partner of Brunswick Group and its cybersecurity practice lead for Asia. Cybersecurity is one critical issue which businesses need to manage better. It's taking up more and more time in board meetings as the board struggles with how their business can manage the evolving threat and one in which the realization is gaining ground that culture is even more important than tech. At any time during this webinar, you can type your questions into the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar, and you can vote for those questions which appeal to you. After Mike has given his address, Sunita will moderate our dialogue, and I'll be back at the end with some brief closing remarks. It is now my pleasure to ask Mike to give his address. Mike. Over to you. Well, a happy Thursday morning to all of you. It's Wednesday evening here on the East Coast of the United States. And I thank you all for taking the time today to spend some time having a conversation about cybersecurity. I also want to thank the Singapore International Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event and for bringing together a wide range of individuals because I think that one of the challenges that we have to deal with in cyber is the fact that there is no single organization, there's no single individual, there's no single group that has all the answers here. There's no single nation that has the answer. So it's about our ability to come together, both locally within our respective nations, but I would argue also globally. I also just wanna say it is always great to have an opportunity to speak to men and women in Singapore. It is one of my favorite places in the world. My wife has always heard me say how much I love Singapore and how cosmopolitan I find it. And to be honest, I was hoping to be there in October for the Formula One race. I'm a big Formula One fan. I've always wanted to be there for the night race in Singapore, but when it was never able to do it when I was in the military and then canceled. So there's always 2022. And I also, in my previous lives, spent a fair amount of time in Singapore. I would always participate in the Shangri-La Dialogue in May. I generally always would come out at least once a year to spend time with the Cybersecurity Agency and David Coe and talk to him about, hey, how could we partner together? I spent a good deal of time with the Security and Intelligence Division. My good friend, Rear Admiral Joseph Long was the director at the time. And then at times with Prime Minister Lee, I just have the greatest of respect for Singapore. So let's then focus a little bit now. I'm gonna take about 10 minutes or so and give you some thoughts on what I see happening in cyber. What is the current dynamic or dynamics out there? And where do I think this is going? Um, first, it clearly, cyber activity has only increased in the last several years. It has always been there. Um, I would argue literally you've seen cyber activity largely nation state driven initially, but starting probably five or 10 years ago, you started to see criminal actors engaged in the use of cyber largely to generate money. Um, but cyber activity has really exploded in the last three years in particular, I would argue. Um, 
you see how it's played out just with, within the last year. We've had some of the biggest penetrations with broadest global impact that we've ever experienced. You have to go back previous to this year, arguably June of 2017, so over four years ago, when NotPetya, which was a Russian attempt to use cyber as a weapon against the Ukrainian government, unfortunately, the technique the Russians used ended up proliferating around the world. We called it the NotPetya virus and ended up infecting um, companies and individual systems all over the world. That was four years ago. We went through a period between about 2017 and 2020 where there was plenty of activity, but we didn't see a large global incident really. And then look what's happened in the last six to nine months. Solar winds, the penetration against, you know, JSB, one of the largest food distribution firms in the world. The Microsoft Exchange hack that we saw the attack in my own nation, the United States, against the Colonial Pipeline Company, which was a private company that runs the single largest pipeline distribution of energy products on the East Coast, from Texas and the Gulf Coast, all the way up the East Coast, up into the New York area. And yet we had a cyber incident where a Russian criminal group was able to penetrate the company and the company felt that they needed to shut down the pipeline to preclude that cyber actor from attempting, attempting to manipulate or in any way make unsafe the pipeline. And in so doing has acknowledged they paid a multi-million dollar ransom. So the visibility of activity has only grown. The scale of the activity has only grown. You're seeing more actors, not just nation states, but more criminal groups are getting involved you're seeing increased skill among these actors. For example, historically, a supply chain attack, and when we say supply chain attack, we mean a cyber actor penetrates a company that provides a software that other companies use. They penetrate that software, and then when the software is uploaded by other companies, they unknowingly are actually not only uploading that software, but they're uploading several viruses that enable this actor, in this case, Russian criminal groups, to enter their systems and gain control. We had never before seen criminal actors use supply chain as a vehicle to penetrate systems. Why? Supply chain attacks generally had historically only been done by nation states. They take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and you really focus on a target for a long time trying to understand it. Now they're popular with nation states because when they're successful, they can be spectacularly successful. Criminals generally, historically, we had not seen them do that very much because criminals tend to focus on return on investment. They wanna hit as many targets, as many companies as they can. They wanna do it as quickly as they can. And then they wanna move on to the next victim, the next target. And so you're seeing criminal actors change their techniques. You're seeing more criminal actors. They're getting much better in terms of their skills and their global impact is much broader. We, we had not seen cyber criminals engaged in cyber activity that was having global impact. But if you look at Cassia, which is again, a company in the United States that produces a software that is used by other companies in this case, a Russian criminal group known as R. Evil was able to use this technique to penetrate over 1,500 companies around the world. So now you're seeing not just nation states have a global impact, but you're seeing criminals have a global impact. And you see that play out if you just look at Singapore. If you look at some of the um, statistics that have been released by CSA, the, the Singapore Cybersecurity Agency, Ransomware in Singapore up 154% in 2020 from 30 some odd cases in 2019 to 89 cases in 2020. I would also argue those numbers are low because most firms still do not publicly acknowledge or report to governments that they have in fact been penetrated. You've seen more use of Singapore infrastructure, servers, IP addresses, 
You have external actors using infrastructure in Singapore as a way to attack companies and organizations around the world. Singapore attractive in the sense that a, a, a highly advanced from a technological perspective nation, lots of technological infrastructure that makes it an attractive target for entities, nation states, criminals who wanna penetrate some of that infrastructure and use it as a vehicle against both the Singapore government as well as Singapore companies. You saw spear phishing in Singapore increased significantly in 2020, and you saw cyber crime, not just ransomware, but criminals who see the growth in e-commerce and who view this as a vehicle to, to try to bring it down, to steal information, credit card information, personally identifiable information that criminals can then sell, if you will, on the dark web. So there's a whole lot of activity going on out there. If I step back, I'd, I'd highlight the following broad trends, if you will. The first, ransomware is becoming universal. It's not no longer focused on a particular business sector. It's not focused on a particular geographic region, a particular country, a particular size of company. You are seeing ransomware, which is the penetration of a computer system by an adversary who once they penetrate the network, they upload software programs that enable them to then gain access. And once they gain access, if you will, they explore the network. Normally that takes some period of time, weeks to months. And then what you watch is they will extract data. The criminals will extract data. Sometimes they do it, they threaten to sell it or provide it to others, or quite frankly, they'll use it to prove to the company, the victim, that they've actually penetrated and they share the data saying, this is what we're holding. But most importantly of late, they also uplo upload encryption programs that lock down the data or the infrastructure of the company. And so a company then is asked to pay a ransom to get the encryption keys so that in fact, the company can then access their networks again. You're seeing this play out around the world. Massive growth. Why? It's about money. You see more criminals involved in this activity because quite frankly, their success rate is growing and the amount of money they're making is growing. So right now where we stand, I don't see criminals and even nation states, their incentive is only to be more aggressive. In addition to the ransomware challenge, which for most companies, is probably the most significant day-to-day -day challenge they face. You're also seeing nation states who have not traditionally engaged in ransomware activities. You're seeing nation states become even more aggressive um, with respect to cyber. Look at what Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, you're seeing almost all of those nations become much more aggressive whether it's Chinese focus on the theft of intellectual property, whether it's the Russians' use of cyber to penetrate networks, to extract information, to then release that information, hoping to, hoping to influence, in the case of the United States, have an impact on our election cycle, attempt to make sure that we stay divided as a nation. So cyber is becoming this tool that we're seeing everywhere, from nation states to criminal groups, to even individuals using it as a tool. And so when I look at the trends, I don't see anything that leads me to believe it's gonna get better in the immediate future. So I would tell any business, this is a long-term challenge. It is not going to go away. So you must develop strategies that account for it, that recognize it. Um, among the other trends I would highlight, the capabilities of these actors, even as we're getting more actors, more criminal groups, for example, they're getting better their abilities are growing. And it's getting to the point where at times it's hard to tell the difference between a criminal group and a nation state. And in some cases you have, what we're seeing in Russia and Eastern Europe, for example, where you have nation states, in this case, the Russians, almost offering sanctuary to criminal groups who are engaged in activities, ransomware foremost, but who are engaged in criminal activity directed against networks all over the world but you can tell those criminal groups in Russia and Eastern Europe, 
if you look at the way they write their programs, for example, oftentimes they will not recognize the .ru domain, which is the Russian domain. Um, many times they're written so they don't recognize Cyrillic language. So if they encounter a keyboard with Cyrillic characters, for example, the, the malware, the software won't work. So there, there clearly is an element of sanctuary here in some parts of the world that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, but this isn't gonna be easy and it's gonna take us a while. I, so as I look in the future, and then I'd like to turn it uh, into questions with Sunitha because the greatest value is going to be in our interaction. If I look at how I think the future is gonna play out, I think you're gonna see number one, greater cooperation internationally. Singapore is doing a great job in that regard, for example. But I think increasingly nations realize, if I take my own nation, for example, much of the cyber activity we are seeing is originating from outside the United States. We know we can't do this by ourselves. We're gonna to need to partner with like-minded nations like Singapore and others around the world. We're gonna to have to come together to deal with this. I also think you are gonna see nation states change the nature of their relationships in cyber with their private sectors. For too long, I think many governments have felt, well, this is really a criminal issue, so I'll let law enforcement deal with it. Or this really is a private sector issue. Companies should really deal with this on their own. I, I just think it's gotten to the point where it's becoming very evident that that approach is just not going to work. This is gonna become about how nation states can help their companies deal with this challenge. It doesn't mean companies don't have a role or responsibility here, but it does mean I believe that you are gonna see governments, and I would argue you're seeing this play out in Singapore, where CSA, for example, has talked about a series of capabilities and partnerships they're gonna be rolling out over the course of the rest of this year and into early 2022, where the Singapore government has committed to stronger relationships, the ability to provide more information, the ability to partner with the private sector to actually work cybersecurity on a real-time basis. I just think that's the way this, this is going. We're gonna to have to come up with a very different model, if you will. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Sunitha, who's gonna act kind of as a, we're gonna do a fireside chat, as we would say in America, and she will also be taking your questions. So I encourage you all, you know, please feel free, ask any question you want on any, any topic. Sunitha, take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, uh, I, 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 we were talking about this a little earlier when, before we started. And, um, you know, I think it's safe to say the timing of the session couldn't be better um, given sort of the number of high profile um, ransomware attacks that we've seen of late. Mike mentioned a few of them. Uh, but also a lot of changes in the regulatory landscape um, in Asia. Um, so this really is becoming a very important issue. Um, just before I kick off with a couple of questions, just a reminder to, to everyone on this call, please um, uh, submit your questions using the Q&A um, tool um, on your screen. Um, and if you want one of the questions uh, to, to be pushed up the, the list, then apparently you can like it and it moves up the list and it makes my life a bit better today. So um, please, you know, come in with as many questions as you have. Um, let me kick off, um, Mike, you talked about sort of the spike in ransomware attacks. You talked about ransomware becoming universal. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, in, in sort of the six years that I've been with, with Brunswick, um, you know, the landscape has changed tremendously. Um, you know, when, when, when I first started working on, on cyber issues, this felt very much like a Western problem. Um, and as you said today, um, you know, it really is universal. Uh, there's been massive growth. To what do you attribute this growth? Why is ransomware in particular growing as fast as it has in the last year or so? So I'd say in no particular order, Number one, the pandemic has helped to drive this. Why? Because as companies and organizations were forced to disperse from workplaces into homes, suddenly we find ourselves working outside of this well-established perimeter. Remember, companies had established cybersecurity perimeters. 
They had a central security stack. They controlled all accesses from the network, if you will, to the cloud and other external services. Suddenly with, with COVID, we're dispersed. We're, we're not working behind this well-defined cybersecurity kind of perimeter. We're not all behind our companies, you know, kind of central security stack. And now we're reaching out from home directly to the cloud and directly to these services. On top of that, also with the pandemic, we proliferated the attack surface. Now we're not only working from working from the office, but now we're working from home. So the the way for criminals to get into companies, to get to individuals, they've got a lot more probability of success from a technical perspective. The last technical or COVID associated trend I would highlight is we also found ourselves using our home infrastructure for purposes for which it wasn't designed, i.e. work. What do I mean by that? Most people if do not, for example, reset the default passwords on their home routers. We, we just never think of that because why? We think well, we're just doing emails and personal work. Why, why would anybody care about that? Except now we're doing corporate work. Now we're accessing corporate databases and pulling down company information, some of which is proprietary, some of which is highly sensitive, some of which is about you know, workforces and employees. So number one, it's technically much easier. Number two, there's more money to be made. Why? Take a look at, for example, the growth in ransomware activity directed against the healthcare segment. That's not by, by chance. When you look at it, companies that are under a high high stress or companies or organizations who are in the middle of intense operations for which they cannot afford disruption have a much higher probability of pain. So why, for example, have they gone off after hospitals and things in the middle of a pandemic? Because they know hospitals don't wanna shut down their computer networks. They know that in the middle of a pandemic, hospitals and healthcare organizations, they wanna do everything they can to stay up so they can continue to support patients in the middle of this massive health issue. And so you've seen companies in many cases more willing to pay. So you put all that together, it's just attracting more and more actors. And the last phenomena that I would highlight, which is what we're really seeing with these Russian criminal groups, and Russia is not the only place. Vietnam is a fairly high number of criminal, cyber criminal groups, for example. But if you just look globally, Russia and Eastern Europe probably has the largest concentrations of cyber, cyber criminal groups of any area in the world. They're not all of it by any stretch of the imagination. And you're seeing these entities being able to operate with relative impunity. The, the Russian government, for example, we in the United States have been very direct up to the Vladimir Putin level. Look, this is totally unacceptable to us. And you can't sit here and tell us that you don't know about it you have no involvement. You have an obligation as a sovereign state to ensure that criminal activities within your borders do not become a global factor outside of your boundary, which is what we're seeing now. So you throw all that together, um, it, it, it just means there's a lot more activity. Last reason, unlike a lot of areas, uh, I used to argue with this in, in nation states, to create militaries, for example, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time and it takes people. You look at cyber on the other hand, it doesn't take much time because capability is available on the internet literally to anywhere. It doesn't take much time. It takes a really low cost investment. You can literally get started in this for thousands of dollars, not millions or billions of dollars, literally you know, a, a couple of thousand and you can pull tools and buy capabilities right off the internet. And then, it also doesn't take thousands of people. Most criminal groups, they tend to number, most cyber criminal groups, they, they're generally in the tens to the hundreds. They're not thousands and tens of thousands of people. So it's easy to, to get into. And then lastly, sadly, as this has become a bigger business, you, it's generated its own business. You can go on the internet now and you can find companies that will sell you or entities that will sell you hacking tools, that will sell, that will act, provide you a service. Hey, we'll set up the Bitcoin wallet for you, 
or hey, we'll negotiate with companies for you that you penetrate. So it's become this industry that is just churning more and more. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in. I think you talked about sort of cybersecurity being a long-term challenge for businesses um, and, and businesses really needing to think about how they can protect themselves and their customers. Um, what do you think businesses should be doing? And I think, in, you know, uh, uh, participants are probably interested in sort of practical steps that they should be taking to protect themselves against, um, you know, cyber risk. Right. And I now find myself in this life, I'm not only part of the Brunswick team, but I, I also work with multiple other companies. I sit on several boards, so I, I now participate in these discussions in, internally about what, what should business, what should companies do. I, I'll share a few, few thoughts. Number one, I always tell every organization, everything starts with an accurate understanding of your own infrastructure. What does your network look like? What data do you have? Where is it? Who can access it? Um, and it's IT and OT. So IT, think about information technology. Think about your networks, what enables you to communicate with each other to access your data. But it's also OT, operating technology. It's the remote accesses that you have put in place to either remotely control processes of manufacturing, for example, um, we're seeing ransomware in particular. It started in the IT segment, and now you're seeing it go after not just IT, but OT. But number one, start with a fundamental understanding of what your structure is. Because one, in my previous life, we, we had both an offensive and a defensive mission. On the defensive side, when we would work with the private sector in the United States, and in a couple instances, companies internationally from, for key partners and allies, I would always find what the IT or CISO or chief information officer thought their network laydown was, wasn't the reality. We, we would go in, we would do the scans, we would look at the network and we would say, you realize you have more devices than you think you do. You have more external connectivity than you think you do. And you granted access privileges to a much bigger portion of your workforce than you told us you did. Put another way, I used to say this to the presidents I worked for in the U.S. I would always say, sir, we cannot defend what we cannot see. If I can't see it, if I don't have awareness of it, I can't defend it. So start with having a good understanding of what your construct is. The, the second thing I would highlight is, look, this is about risk. There is not enough money. There is not enough people. There's not enough time to guarantee that you will never have a cybersecurity problem. So to me, I always used to argue, we need to make investment decisions based on a risk prioritization. What elements in our organization have the greatest impact on our ability to execute our mission, whether that is being a, a goods or a service company, what is it that were we to lose access or functionality, we could not function as an organization? Because those areas, that's where you want to prioritize. There's some areas in your structure you can take some measure of risk. Hey, if I were to lose this, it would be an inconvenience, but it wouldn't stop me. I could continue to operate. Um, so you need to think about prioritizing based on risk. And risk is not just a computer or IT decision. Risk is a business decision. Again, another thing I used to say, and I still do now with, with companies, I would tell every chairman or CEO, do you want your IT team to be deciding what is the most important part of your business infrastructure? Is that something you and your business operations piece should be deciding? Because if you don't get involved, your IT team is going to do what they, good, hardworking people, they're going to do what they think is right. But I guarantee you their perspective is going to be different from a CEO, from a chief operating officer, from a chairman, for example. So for boards, for company leadership, you have to embrace this as a business element, not as some specialized function that my CISO, my CIO, my chief risk officer, hey, that's what they do. Mm. Don't, don't do it that way. Lastly, I give you three things to think about. Again, as I said, in my previous life, I, I, I both defended and was part of teams that defended networks for a living. 
but I've also been very public in acknowledging I, I, I was part of teams that penetrated networks for a living. And when you're looking to penetrate a network, generally, it varies a little bit by the actor, but you're looking at three different elements. Number one, you're trying to understand the target's network structure. That was the first thing I kind of talked about. Number two, you're trying to understand the target, or in this case, you know, we're talking about a, a company. In my previous life, it was largely foreign, you know, elements associated with things like nuclear programs and et cetera. But um, the second thing you looked at is what's the human terrain? What individuals have access to this network? Because if I can't get into the network itself, if I can access an individual, whether spear phishing or other things through work, but also through home, Think about this now, we're all working from home. Um, there was always a human element. So we would always try to look at who are the key members of the workforce that have the highest access or who are key members of the workforce who work directly for people who have the highest access. Love executive assistants. You know, they're, they're generally in all the leaderships and the, the executive secretary, they are generally tied in fully into the leadership. They're very attractive targets in some cases. So network structure, the human structure. And then the last thing we always looked at, the supply chain or ecosystem. So who provides their key capabilities? Who's writing their software? Who's providing their software? That's where the supply chain piece becomes, which we've seen becomes important. So remember, it's more than just your network. Lastly, the hardest part in all this is not technology. The hardest part in all this is culture. Man, I can remember a couple of times sitting in, in the White House Situation Room and you know, getting this, damn it, why is this so hard? And I would say, because Mr. President, this is about in the end, men and women. It's about culture. It, it's so much less about technology. Look, we can spend all the money in the world, we can have the latest technology, but if we have a workforce, that doesn't understand the, some of the choices they're making when they're accessing email. If we have a workforce that's not informed, if we have a workforce that doesn't understand what we're trying to do in cyber. If we don't have a workforce that feels they're part of the solution, it's like fighting with one hand tied behind your back. You can never forget the human piece in all of this. Um. Thank you, Mike. And there's quite a lot there, I think, to to um, to follow up on. So I think the first question that we got in um, that you just sort of talked about in terms of uh, managing the supply chain and the ecosystem, um, we have one participant asking, how do you think about managing third party vendor risk? Um, and what are some key tips when assessing a third party from a cybersecurity perspective? So number one, I always wanted, I always thought it was important. In this case, I'll, I'll use the Department of Defense. Think of it as a business, but it was the business I was a part of. What I used to tell our secretary was, sir, we need to understand who is providing services to our department. What is the nature of those services? Whether it's something, it could be equipment, it could be analysis, it, it could be access. We need to understand who our key partners are here. We need to understand the nature of the relationship. We need to do a risk-based assessment about, again, which of these potentially are more critical. Uh, I'll give you an example. In my previous life, it took us a while to figure out why were the Chinese so interested in law firms? We, we kept seeing them go after law firms. And it, we scratched our head for a while until we realized, wow, most firms use outside counsel to do their patent and trademark work with the US government, for example. They're going after law firms because companies are giving law firms their intellectual property for their patent and their trademark filings. That's why they're going after law firms. So again, think about the ecosystem. Who has access? Who has connectivity? Who has your critical data? Because invariably we find it's not just a company. They have opened it. Yeah, it's not a criticism in this highly interconnected world. The reality is it's very hard to say, well, I'm just gonna control everything. And in many ways you look at cloud and other things that have been viewed as more secure, as well as off offering better, co better costs, more efficient, cheaper. The, the reality is the days where we're just gonna control everything directly, I, I don't see us going back to that. 
So we got to figure out in this more dispersed world, it, again, it's all about risk to me, but it all starts by asking ourselves, okay, who are my key suppliers? What do they provide me? What's the nature of our relationship? And lastly, remember, you often have a key relationship or leverage in that relationship in the form of a contract. The, the argument I used to make with the Secretary of Defense was, sir, every service that's provided to us has a legal underpinning in the form of a contract. We can specify in our contracts minimum standards that they must meet. Why aren't we using that leverage? They want to do business with us. You know, we're, uh, and it's not unique to the Department of Defense, but my argument was, look, we're, we're a business that's putting a lot of money into the economy. Companies want access to that money. They want to do business with us. They do it on a contractual basis. We have leverage. Because the biggest thing we used to hear from the private sector was, look, as long as you establish standards that apply to all of us, we can live with it. But don't generate standards and then say only one or two of us have to do this and then everybody else doesn't because then you're given an unfair competitive advantage to others. And as long as the playing field is level, we'll deal with it. Thank you. Um, the next question is about culture. Um, I think you referred to this a number of times and we were talking about this earlier as well. Um, and you just said the hardest part is not the technology, the hardest part is culture. Um, you know, how do organizations and businesses in particular build a culture of resilience um, against cybersecurity, um, particularly in today's environment, right? Where not everyone is sitting in an office and everyone's sort of, uh, you know, in hybrid working conditions. So number one, leadership must communicate a clear sense of priority and focus here. If most people, if they, if they sense that their bosses don't care about something, they tend not to care about it. Put another way, it used to be a running joke in the, in the military, what is of casual interest to my boss becomes of, a, becomes of amazing focus to me. So, so as leaders in an organization, you must articulate an expectation and you must communicate that you view this as something important, that you are gonna align resources, people, prioritization, time against, um, and that you believe that this is something that every member of the team must participate in. It, again, it can't just be the IT, the CIO, the help desk. It's got to be everybody working together. The next thing that comes to mind is you want to incentivize positive behaviors and reward good behavior. And you want to de-incentivize or in some cases punish bad behavior. Um, one discussion I've had with several companies is, I bet if you look at your data, many companies now are doing spear phishing training where they will routinely send out sample spear phishing emails to try to see if they can get members of the workforce to actually click on it and open themselves to a vulnerability as a kind of test, if you will. I, I said to some companies, and I certainly found this in my previous life, I said, look, I bet you find you got a small number of people who tend to be repeat offenders. I always said, look, it's our duty to train them. It's our duty to educate them. But at some point, we got to hold them responsible. And if you're an individual who just constantly disregards our processes, disregards the training and places our business, your fellow employees, your company at risk, whether it's risk associated with the ability to do the mission, so to speak, or whether it's risk associated with reputation. You know, you gotta hold people accountable. So I always said, look, very publicly reward people. When people do positive things in cybersecurity, talk about it, publicize it, reward them. I used to say, look, for every person who, you know, correctly responds to the fear spear phishing test, give them a $10 gift, gift card somewhere. You know, highlight the fact that they're being successful. Give them a tangible benefit or reward. It's amazing how hard people work when they think there's a tangible benefit or reward or recognition. I'm not trying to be cynical. It's just human nature in my experience. So again, take advantage of culture. Take advantage of human nature. See how you can turn it to generate better outcomes for the organization. I also think 
CEOs, company leaders need to constantly or on a regular basis be talking about this. This isn't something that's, okay, once a year, I'm gonna do a company um, you know, session. I'll take questions from the workforce. And in my remarks, I'll talk about cybersecurity. Okay, that's the check in the box. I don't have to do this for another year. You have to reinforce this over and over and over again. It's hard to over communicate when it comes to cyber security. And then lastly, it's got to be a focus that sustains itself over time. This problem isn't gonna go away and you, you might be the most successful company in the world in terms of cybersecurity, but you're not gonna fix this in a few months. That, that's just not the dynamic here. That's great, thank you. And um, you know, it's it's interesting because we, you know, we ourselves do um, these spear phishing tests, and it's quite interesting to think about how to take that to the next level in terms of you know incentivizing um, the right behaviors. Um, a related question about uh, talent, um, you know, how should companies be thinking about uh, cybersecurity talent? What kind of talent do they need in this space? Um, and what kind of attributes make, um, you know, uh, good, good people to, to help guide a company through, um, you know, handling this risk? So I used to say, look, there's three kind of populations we need to think about. We're going to have a hardcore, very focused segment of our workforce that is all about day-to-day -day ensuring our cybersecurity. There are help desk. There are CIO and IT teams. The level of knowledge and the expertise they need to have is at one end of the spectrum. I said at the other end of the spectrum is we need to ensure that our leadership across the organization, and I'm not talking just the senior most, our leadership needs to understand cybersecurity broadly, and they need to be able to translate whatever their mission or part of the mission is, whether they're the chief operating officer or they're a business product development entity, they need to think about how what they do fits into this cybersecurity strategy of the company. And then somewhere in the middle is the broad workforce. How do we educate them? How do we make them smart? So the skills you need, the training and education you have to focus on, and the numbers are all gonna vary within those three populations. Another thing about numbers, there are very few companies that are able to gain access to all the cyber expertise they feel they need. There's just, I think that's the nature of this. There is always gonna be a shortfall. So one, and it was certainly true for me in, in, in the Department of Defense and the, the two cyber organizations, which are among the largest in the US, among the largest in the world, we didn't have all the expertise. We didn't have all the people that I wish we had. So the two things I always thought about were number one, how can I use technology to augment people? And how can I use technology to ensure that I'm using those scarce human resources to maximum value? Put another way, I used to tell everybody, we need to make sure that people are doing things that are optimized for humans and not machines. Because there's a lot of things we do that a machine can do. So let's make sure we're maximizing our human capital here and not using people to do repetitive, simple tasks that quite frankly, a machine can do, for example, looking at pattern recognition for cybersecurity. So I always would tell organizations, you need to think about that aspect of it. Um, you know, we talked about the role of a CISO um, so a chief information security officer, um, you know, but obviously not all companies have this, this function in place. Um, so who's, whose role is this? Who's, whose problem is this to, to deal with sort of cybersecurity and, you know, get all of this organized within the organization? That's the first question. Um, and I guess a related question is, what is the role of the, the board, do you think, um, in, 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 in terms of cybersecurity? Jack, so let me start with the board and then I'll get to the other one. You remind me again of the other one when I get there, Stephen. So, and again, I find myself now talking to a lot of boards and sitting on boards. And what I have always believed is a board's function is strategic direction and oversight. It is not 
replicating day-to-day -day functionality of corporate leadership. That's not what a board is there to do. So I always said, look, it's the same in cyber. A board should be focused on asking itself, do we think we broadly have the right cybersecurity strategy? Do we think we are appropriately resourced to execute that strategy? Do we believe that the company leadership understands this problem, is appropriately prioritizing this problem? And then lastly, we never talk about this enough. As a board, how can you help your company's leadership with respect to cyber? You know, one of the things I always look for for any part of any team I'm a part of, I always look for bosses or overseers who not only held me accountable, but also said to me, Mike, what can I do to help you? Yeah. I, I just never like boards and other oversight functions whose view is that's not my problem. I'm, I'm just here to you know, pound you in the chest as it were. You're all one team trying to work together. You got different focuses. You got different prisms you look through, but you're all trying to work together broadly. So I would say broadly, that's kind of the role at the board um, level. And I always encourage boards, your CEO and his or hers cybersecurity leadership should be interacting regularly with the board. When a board has not spoken to whoever is in charge of cybersecurity for a company, that is not a good sign. And I will run into that occasionally where it'll be, well, we just talked to the CEO, you know, because we don't really get into oversight and day to day. And my comment was, when it comes to money, do you not talk to the CFO? So why is it when it comes to cyber, you wouldn't talk to the person in the organization that, that's accountable for it? Last point about boards. I often hear on boards, and even in some corporate leadership, I'll often hear, you know, well, I'm not a technical person. I, I don't really have a lot of background here. It's not something I'm really personally comfortable with. And I always used to say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're here because we understand risk. We're here because we understand strategic direction, vision, and oversight. We're not here because we're the day-to-day -day experts on every function in the organization. And the analogy I often use is, you know, very few members on a board in my experience actually, for example, have been chief financial officers. And yet I have never once heard a board member say, hey, I don't do money. I, I apologize, but I don't do money. I was never a CFO. Yet I would hear board people all the time say, I don't do cyber. I apologize. I was never a CISO. I'm not an IT. I'm like, stop. This is about risk. Now it's risk within a specific element, cybersecurity, but it's about risk. What was the first part of the question again? And I'll pivot to that. Uh, the first part of the question was who should be responsible for this? Um, you know, when a company doesn't have a CISO. So there's a couple strategies. You see some companies say, you know, either I'm, I'm too small or I don't feel I have the expertise, or it's too expensive for me to acquire the expertise internally. I see increasingly a lot of companies outsourcing their cybersecurity function. They might go to a, a not endorsing any particular one, but they might go to a CrowdStrike. They might go to a FireEye. Um, you know, they outsource the function, so to speak. Within those organizations that this, they decide they need to do this internally, I broadly have seen two constructs. They either feel that it's so specialized that they need to create a cybersecurity structure, whether it's a CISO, you know, a, a chief information security officer or a CIO, a chief information officer. The, the other model that I've seen a lot of companies starting to use is a chief risk officer kind of idea. Hey, look, we're gonna treat this as an element of risk and therefore I want my chief risk officer really to, to be the driver. Whichever approach you take, one thing I tell leadership is, look, you must have accountability and a well-defined structure that everybody, whatever it is, it needs to be well-defined and it needs to be understood by everybody. Because in the middle of a crisis, you do not want confusion about, so who's responsible for cybersecurity? Who's running this? That is not the time to have these conversations. 
Thank you. Um, I think let's shift now to talk a little bit about our ransom and the regulatory landscape. Um, you know, as many of you will be aware, last month the US opened a bit of a debate over the merits of making ransom payments, particularly after the colonial pipeline attack. Um, and this is a practice that is opposed by the FBI. Um, we have a question here, which is to what extent do you expect the Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC uh, to enforce regulations against companies and individuals that make or facilitate ransomware payments? So I fully expect it to. And in fact, this happened before. They reinforced it again with Colonial Pipeline. But if you go back to October of 2020, 2020 so you know, nine months ago, OFAC. <laughs> put out a reminder that said, as a reminder, it is against US law and policy to pay ransom to any entity, whether it be nation, state, group, or individual, any entity currently under sanction by the United States or any broad international body, like the United Nations, as an example. And it reminded people in October of 2020, well before this latest round of challenges, look, you cannot do this under specific conditions. And subsequently, you've seen both the FBI, CSA, and Singapore has said, David said the same thing. Hey, look, we do not believe that companies should be paying ransom and we encourage companies to not, to not do so. I fully expect that increasingly you're gonna see legal and regulatory re regimes put in place that prohibit ransomware payments or control the circumstances and will require private companies to first interact with the government or a regulatory body for consultation before just deciding unilaterally to pay the ransom. That is one of the things that the colonial pipeline scenario, so a private company that runs the single greatest distribution center on the East Coast of the United States for energy in the summer, it's largely um, the pipeline system, and it is a system, it's not a single pipe. The system moves about 45% of the total automobile gasoline that we, we refine and distribute on the East Coast of the United States. In the winter, the same pipeline is also used for home heating fuel, for example, here in North America. I often tell people, look, Colonial, which was an event that occurred in the spring for us, and it was about a week in duration. You look at the impact that had, in some cases, long gas lines, gas stations running out of fuel, particularly in the southernmost part of the United States, Georgia, Texas, Virginia, in the Metro DC area. Um, I, I was off the pipeline, but I'm further north in the metropolitan Philadelphia area. And we were lucky, we did not have significant distribution impacts and we could get gasoline, but, it uh, the, the thing I found the most shocking of all was, so we have a private company that controls 40, 45% of the distribution of gasoline among the most densely populated portion of the United States, the East Coast, that unilaterally decided on its own that it was going to pay a ransom and it was going to shut down the distribution system and did not consult with the government, nor did the government seem to feel that they should insert themselves. I just think one of the lessons, at least in the US, for Colonial Pipeline is we're going to need to look at identifying critical infrastructure. We're going to need to look at identifying single points of failure or single points of impact. I don't think the US government had been a lot of, done a lot of time thinking, so what happens if 45% of our fuel distribution suddenly goes offline? What are we going to do? I don't think that that had been a particularly thought through scenario. I, I think you're gonna see that changing. I fully expect that you're gonna see a different approach with certain sectors, energy, finance, transportation. I, I would also argue you're also gonna see, and it's, it's broader than cyber, but you're gonna see a different approach to technologies. You're gonna see some technologies, I think that are viewed as critical for national security or economic competitiveness, the government's gonna take a totally different, I think, role in development and oversight. So think about artificial intelligence, think about quantum, think about 5G, technologies that will really shape and drive 
economic advantage in the digital economy of the 21st century. I think you're going to see a different government approach there as well. Um, a sort of slightly related question, but perhaps a bit more uh, on a practical level. Um, you know, it seems like ransomware attacks are really on the rise. Um, is there anything organizations can be doing beforehand to, in terms of thinking about ransom payments? Or do you basically just wait for the moment and then, as you say, sort of make a decision, have a discussion with regulators, et cetera? So no, 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 no. What I always try to tell every organization is you should spend time in advance. So for example, and Sunitha, you're part of this as well. We generally will not advise companies to have a blanket yes or no policy. That the smartest thing to do is identify in advance the criteria you are going to use to make a decision as to whether or not you should pay. Among those criteria are, well, what is the legal and regulatory framework here? Do I even have a choice? Um, but at least today, in the majority of instances, most companies actually have some measure of latitude. Again, it varies by nation and it varies by the sector, but broadly, again, which is why so many companies are paying and why criminals are engaging more and more in this. Um, so you wanna think in advance about what, what's the criteria you're gonna use? Because you, trust me, I've been in the middle of this in my, pre, again, in my previous life when and actors had penetrated some of the networks I was responsible for defending and we're trying to figure out how we're gonna to respond to this. Um, I, I can still remember the first time I ever went to our Secretary of Defense and said, sir, you're not going to believe this, but we're getting ransomware attacks. And I can remember the Secretary said to me, they're trying to, to extort the U.S. government, the Department of Defense. They, they do know that we have weapons, right? I mean, we're not just going to pay this. He, I can still remember he was very shocked about this. They said, sir, it just goes to show. You got a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are looking for money from whatever source to include the DOD and, and the US government. And you are seeing governments, at least in the United States, we've seen governments down to the local city and county level whose systems have been locked down and who have paid ransomware. So as a company, I urge you, think about the criteria in advance, develop a playbook in advance that outlines how you're gonna respond, who has what responsibility, the general process you're going to use, what kind of what kind of structures and mechanisms and collaborative groups you're going to put in place, who has what responsibility, and then train, exercise, simulate, you know, pretend that you've had an event and walk through it, learn from it, and then keep updating that playbook. Keep updating your strategy. Keep updating your training. You know, Boy, uh, anything you can do in advance is going to save you time in the middle of a crisis. And then one last point that we didn't we didn't talk about it, but one of the hardest challenges for businesses in dealing with an actual ransomware attack or an actual of cyber event, if you will. Number one, we tend to think in advance about the technical side, but the two challenges I find that most companies really have challenges with assessing the reputational risk. And then secondly, figuring out how they want to communicate or if they want to communicate about this. In, in general, I don't think companies spend enough time thinking in advance, what is our communication approach going to be? Who do we need to communicate to? Do we need to talk to our regulators? Do we need to talk to our shareholders? Do we need to talk to the general public? Do we need to talk to our customers, our suppliers, You know, the supply chain piece? You need to think about that in advance um, because communication is one of the hardest aspects of all of this. And that has, that's not your IT team. That's not your cybersecurity team. That's all about your communications and your big business leadership side, trying to figure out how much are we going to say, who are we going to say it to, how frequently do we want to communicate. You want to get out in front because what you're seeing in some ways is organization's ability to respond to a cyber crisis is becoming a market differentiator. You are seeing companies that respond very well, who actually generate respect. Um, I would argue if you go back to SolarWinds, for example, it was a private US company. In this case, it wasn't SolarWinds, it was FireEye 
who first ident a cybersecurity firm who first identified this because their system was penetrated, but they found it and they went very public saying, hey, look, this has happened to us. This is what we are doing, but we want to make sure the broader ecosystem out there understands that it's not just an issue for us. It's an issue for a whole lot of other companies. I thought they really strengthened their reputation as a proactive, aggressive, honest, communicative organization that was thinking about not just themselves and their own customers, but the broader ecosystem out there. On the other hand, I would argue you could look at Colonial Pipeline. That is not a good way. It, it is a bad sign, for example, when a week into the events, the US government in the form of the Department of Homeland Security, which in the US structure has overall responsibility for government and cybersecurity and interactions with our private sector, you had DHS, this portion of the US government, publicly come out a week after this event had started and say, well, we still don't have a complete picture from Colonial. We don't really understand exactly what happened. We don't understand exactly what they did or why they did it. And they haven't really communicated to us the specifics of this so that we can learn from it and then try to share it with others. That, that is not how you grow a good company reputation. Um, while you're on the subject, we had a question in relation to the US landscape. Um, so President Biden has hired a number of cybersecurity experts recently. <coughs> Um, and there's a question about whether there's any direction change in the cybersecurity and infrastructure, infrastructure security agency or DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, and, and what the world can sort of expect uh, in the months ahead. Jack, so I, I would argue President Biden, now in fairness, they have all either worked for me or with me, and I with them, so I know all of them. Um, I believe President Biden has really upped the level of individuals that he has focused on cyber. They have deep knowledge, deep experience. <clears throat> and in two of the three primary individuals, they not only had government experience, but they also had experience in the private sector. So they bring a combination of backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences, which I think is very, very important here. They also have experienced the pain of cyber themselves. Nothing teaches you like pain. So they're very incentivized. Um, I think the positive side for us on the US side is we've got some great people. The challenge I think on us, on our side is I don't think we still got the structure exactly right. And we'll see how that plays out. CISA, for example, highly motivated, hardworking men and women but we're asking one organization to be both a cyber policy entity as well as a cyber operations entity. They don't have enough people, they don't have an ex expertise, um, and they don't have enough authority to do what we're expecting them to do. And so I think in some ways, there are some parts of the structure that are not optimized. I do think that you're gonna see out of this team though, a more aggressive approach, Again, I think the role of the government's gonna change. You're gonna to start to see the government, I think working more directly with um, you know, the private sector. I mean, personally for me, nothing frustrated me more, both when I was in the government and now when I'm outside, you know, is all the support we talk about what the government is doing after an event. And I'm going, so what are we doing beforehand to try to stop this from happening? And what are we doing in the middle of it to mitigate it and lessen the impact? What is this focus on responding after, you know, the barn door is open and all your cows and horses are out of the barn? What, what is the value of that? Not that it has no value, but the whole goal is to make sure those animals are safe in the first place. Not, hey, we got to go chase them down and, and get them back. That's not what we want to do. So I, I think you're going to see a different approach. Lastly, I also think you're gonna see this government on the US side using cyber as a tool or element of broader international cooperation. You can already see them talking about, hey, we've got to develop multilateral, international, multi-party solutions to this. We just can't do this nation by nation because actors understand that. So, so the criminals and the nation states, they're counting on poor response, poor coordination, poor collaboration, that helps them.
thank you. Um, we have a really interesting question, and you you referenced the the recent research by the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. You know, talking about the rise in ransomware cases, um, and uh, the, the, you know, based on the statistics, um, the cases have affected mostly small and medium enterprises um, in, in in specific sectors, including manufacturing, retail, and healthcare. Okay. Um, so we have a question about how SMEs with limited resources. Um, you know, can strengthen their cybersecurity initiatives and programs. And I, I imagine quite a lot of them in the last year or so as a result of COVID have gone digital, have been using, you know, the internet a lot more, um, yeah. but again, are constrained by limited resources. So what, what advice do you have for them, Mike? So number one, there is power in numbers. So pool expertise. How can you identify groups that have multiple elements, multiple parties, so in the United States, for example, we went with a sector approach where we tried to get multiple organizations, large to small, in similar business sectors to partner together on cyber. Because we found that regardless of size, there was a commonality within the sector about risk, network construction, et cetera, that made coordination and collaboration easier. We tried a one-size-fits-all approach initially and we would be dealing with multiple companies who would say, that's not my business model. You know, I don't do point of sale stuff. Why, why would I be worried about point of sale security? That's not my business model. Why are you lumping me in with retail? That, that's not how we work. So we decided we needed to go with a sector approach. Look for organizations who focus or have an element focused on cybersecurity. So like um, SICK is an example. And this program is an example. Look, there are collaborative Chamber of Commerce and other organizations who are available to help tap expertise and provide insights to companies that might find themselves, hey, look, we don't have the money, we don't have the resources, we don't have the expertise, this is really hard for us. Lastly, I'm sure CSA does this in Singapore. I know the US government does this. The US government, we spent a lot of time trying to identify information that we could make available to the public, to the private sector, that provided basic information that gave businesses a place to start. What are the fundamentals of security for a network? What are the principles I need to be mindful of? How do I build and create cybersecurity? We tried to create templates, if you will, that private industry could use, particularly elements in private industry. We just didn't have you know, access to a lot of money. I mean, you look at the financial side in the United States, for example, you know, among the world's biggest banks and financial institutions. I mean, Bank of America, has, for example, has publicly said our baseline cybersecurity budget is $500 million. That's not in a crisis, that's just our baseline budget. There aren't a lot of companies out there who can afford half a billion dollars a year in basic cybersecurity investment. So we've got to acknowledge a one size fits all approach probably isn't gonna work. There's just too wide a disparity, resources, et cetera. That's great. Um, on a related note, um, you know, we find more and more companies now um, collect, you know, store and handle um, customer data, right? Um, and in particular, I'd, I'd say in Asia, we've seen a huge growth in, um, you know, uh, uh, consumer internet companies that are disrupting, um, you know, traditional models and, you know, bringing new kinds of services to, to customers, you know, whether it's in spaces like ride hailing or financial services or food delivery. Um, you know, obviously these organizations are sitting on a huge amount of, of data, of customer data. Um, how should how should organizations be thinking about you know the, the data that they hold um, and you know not just managing that data but also actively communicating to customers about how that data is managed and protected over time? So the first thing is make sure you understand exactly what data you hold. I am amazed sometimes organizations don't fully understand the, the data they've extracted and they're holding. So make sure you understand the data that you're holding. Where is it located? Who has access to it? How are you using it? 
And what sorts of controls or oversight mechanisms have you put in place? And in my previous life at the National Security Agency, man, this was a huge focus for us. We put in rigid controls as to who could access the data we were collecting, how it was used. We had a methodology for purging it regularly. We didn't just endlessly hold everything like some vacuum cleaner. You know, we had a specific regime about purging data so we didn't hold it forever. Um, and so I urge companies to do the same. I also urge companies, you should not only develop a series of standards, but you should publicize and promote that. Your customers and your workforce need to understand what your approach to data is. Because um, there's high interest in this, whether it's, you know, regimes like uh, GDPR, you know, out of the EU, the Global Data Protection Regulation, um, which is a legal framework about companies doing business within the EU and what you have to do with respect to data controls, data access. In the United States, we don't have a federal law, but our in, we have 50 different states make up the United States. Many of those states, particularly California, have become very aggressive and passed state laws that apply to corporations that are operating in their states, like out in California, as an example. So I would urge organizations, hey, think about you know, how you want to publicize this, how you want to communicate it, and then how you adhere to it. Because there is nothing worse for reputation than you said this was your position on data, but we subsequently find out publicly you did it, you had a very different regime. That that is a reputation killer in the current environment. Thank you. Um, sort of a related question about um, cyber insurance. Um, I, I, I imagine I, you know, we, we see that it's getting increasingly um, popular, I think, in Asia, and we see more and more companies sort of uh, signing up to um, cyber insurance. Um, do you have any thoughts on, you know, how businesses should be thinking about this um, and, and planning ahead? So you're, as a business, you're trying to figure out how you ensure you understand risk, and then you're trying to develop strategies that help you mitigate risk. Cyber insurance is one way, one element of risk mitigation strategy for a company. Um, I wish the insurance companies tied premiums and premium costs to as a vehicle to shape company behavior. What do I mean? If you look at what auto, auto insurance did, at least in the United States, to shape both consumer behavior and corporate behavior in terms of safety in vehicles. Auto insurance companies in the United States said, if you buy a car with the following safety features, think about uh, automated braking systems, crash survivability test results, um, air, certain number of air, airbags, insurance provided uh, coverage at a lower cost. So they incentivized consumer choice, as well as corporate behavior. So automobile manufacturers, both because of law and also because they realized, hey, consumers are being incentivized to buy safer cars. Automobile manufacturers started making safe, safer vehicles. Um, I, I wish cyber insurance would do the same. Could we tie premium cost, for example, to have you done the following cybersecurity kinds of things? At the moment, most policies aren't written that way. They, they just, for a certain premium, you get a certain level of coverage. And it's interesting, you're watching the cyber insurance industry reassess in the face of all this ransomware. You're seeing premiums go up. You're seeing some cyber insurance providers saying, you know, we need to mitigate risk here. We are gonna assume some level of risk, but we're gonna spread the risk among other insurers. So the, the reinsurance segment, for example, is getting, is getting even bigger in cyber insurance companies because because insurance companies are trying to mitigate risk, you know, themselves. Thank you. Sorry. Problems with the mute button. Um, there was a question around um, how we help companies uh, deal with the cyber incident, um, you know, or who have suffered a cyber attack. Um, but I, I'd like to sort of add on to that with an additional question, uh, which, which we get asked a lot by, by clients uh, in Asia, um, which is, 
um, you know, how do you balance uh, in, you know, if you're hit by ransomware or a data breach, um, you know, how do you balance the fact that you don't always have complete information about what's happened or what data has been affected with the idea of communicating in an open and transparent way with customers? Because there is obviously an expectation um, that, yeah. you know, that you, you keep customers informed. But equally, you may not have all the information and you may not really be in a position to say very much. So, you know, how do you balance that? And again, I think in the context, Mike, more broadly of how we help clients um, through. Yeah. Through so events. one of the first things we try to do is communicate to companies. One of the things that makes a cyber event a real challenge is that decision makers must act with incomplete and offer it often inaccurate information. The reality is you are probably not gonna be able to wait until you have perfect knowledge. So you're gonna to have to make decisions, you're gonna to have to make choices, you're gonna to have to develop response strategies, acknowledging that the information you have is incomplete. So put another way, as a military guy, I used, used to remind my teams, in the face of uncertainty, we will adopt strategies that maximize flexibility in case we get it wrong. So I wanna adopt strategies that maximize our, our flexibility, that enable us to pivot a lot easier in case we got it wrong. Um, so the first thing is, you got to be comfortable with this. And again, it's another part of this thinking about this ahead of time. That you got to you got to actually simulate and train this. It's easy to say. I have just watched organizations, their leadership literally freeze, and say, "Look, I'm just not comfortable making this decision until I get more knowledge." And I'm going, "That's not going to work." Secondly, you need to include uncertainty as an element of your communication strategy. You need to, to communicate that there is a level of uncertainty here, that our knowledge is imperfect, that what I'm sharing with you reflects our insights and our level of awareness as of a place, a place in time. And that is likely to change and evolve over time. If you're upfront with people about that expectation, I think they're much more, oh, okay, I got it. You know, you're still, it's early, you're still trying to figure this out. Okay. It's when you come out with these definitive declarations. And then eight hours later, you got to come back and say, well, you know, that, that's really not a complete picture. So it, it, a lot of times it's the way you communicate, not just what you communicate. So I encourage organizations, acknowledge the uncertainty and try to communicate that because people understand this. You know, they acknowledge that the it's going to be imperfect, but culturally it's just interesting sometimes to watch organizations. And particularly if you look at, uh, Again, CEOs oftentimes tend to be highly capable, type A, take charge individuals. And they're used to this idea of, I, I like to have really good knowledge be before I start talking, before I start making decisions. In my experience, boy, that, it, that just is not the norm. You got to respond quicker than that. Uh, hey, lastly, I did want, it was a kind of tangent on the previous question, but I saw somebody asked it. There is a discussion, I'm talking about insurance. There is a discussion and there is a train of thought out there that says by not tying insurance to specific cybersecurity investments on the part of companies, that you are incentivizing to say, hey, look, we're just going to treat it as a risk. It's the cost of doing business. That's what we got insurance for. If it happens, oh well. Again, it's another reason why I wish we would change the model a little bit and incentivize actual concrete behaviors that are designed to tangibly increase or improve your cybersecurity. So there is that train of thought out there, but I would still argue cyber insurance is better than, than no insurance. It's a, it's a good element in a broader risk mitigation strategy. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I think we'll probably conclude there and um, you know, the space is changing so much, not just the threat landscape, but, you know, the way insurance is evolving, um, uh, customer expectations, you know, people's perceptions of, of cybersecurity and, and data security in particular. Um, it's, it's really great to be able to sort of talk about this. And I think we're all constantly as well learning and adapting as we go along, even those of us who, who are in this business. Um, so it's been an absolute pleasure um, talking to you for the last hour. And thank you to all the participants for all your brilliant questions. Um, I hope you found this useful. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Victor. Thank you. And I send my thanks as well. Thank you all.
Well, thank you both. Uh, thanks, Mike and, and Sunita, for a, a, a really enjoyable session um, filled with uh, the insight born of being practitioners uh, and born of sitting on boards, helping clients. And clearly, not only is the risk um, not going away, it's evolving, it will continue to evolve. It therefore needs to be managed. And I very much like the the key messages that came through um, from Mike's address and also from the answers to the questions that preparation is key, but culture is key, leadership is key, and the difference between the board that sits back and whacks someone for getting something wrong but and the board that rolls their sleeves up and says, how can we help you, is also something that um, we will take away and think about. So thank you both. Very insightful. And once again, many thanks to the great firm that you represent for collaborating with us uh, today. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this morning's webinar. Um, we've got two new event series that we're, we've launched uh, this quarter, uh, one on board focus, very much along the lines of um, what boards are thinking about or worrying about or maybe what they should be thinking and worrying about and the one that we launched yesterday something equally important and that is what has got to change in society and our workforce to enable women and men to lead more fulfilling lives we don't pretend to have all the answers um, we rely on you to let us know um, what topics you would like us to cover. So feel free to contact us um, with your thoughts and ideas and suggestions. But for now, from all of us at SICC, big thank you to Mike and Sunita and goodbye from all of us here. Thank you so much.